Hi, welcome to the GRC Summit 20. Joining me today is Miguel, Chief Risk Officer, Lease Plan USA. Natalia has been Chief Risk Officer of Lease Plan USA for the past five years. Uh, Lease Plan USA is a global leader in fleet management services. She holds multiple degrees, including Masters in Applied Math from DePaul University, as well as Masters degree in Risk Management from NYU Stern School of Business. She brings over 20 years of experience in banking and financial services to the table, um, and she is a corporate risk expert with a strong passion for analytics, change management, as well as leadership. Welcome, Natalia. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you very much for letting me um, contribute to the GRC Summit 2020. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And as you just noted, indeed, I have uh, quite an extensive experience in risk management. I currently lead a team uh, who really cuts across nearly every single domain that we are exposed to. A risk domain that we are exposed to at least plan USA, um, essentially all but a legal risk. So I am responsible for credit risk, asset risk, treasury, reputational uh, risk and uh, compliance and privacy, as well as information security, and probably a couple more as well. So I am very happy today to speak with you about integrated risk management, as this is really sort of my bread and butter and um, what an incredible um, moment that we are getting together during this COVID crisis, which can be really a, a quite an exercise in integrated risk management and its functioning and ensuring that it is well set up and well executed. Um, so today I'm very happy to share with you some of the risk management or risk management best practices that I have collected uh, throughout uh, various years, um, organizations, teams, um, and more. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to cover uh, briefly how I'm going to structure my topic and my talk today. I'd like to start talking about a little bit about the integrated risk management and what it is. And of course, there are um, widely accepted and understood uh, definitions of IRM, but I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper into particular three elements that I find to be very helpful and very tangible. I'll cover data analytics and intelligence. I will cover um, communication and team management uh, team management as well, including roles and responsibilities from the context and perspective of integrated risk management, um, organizational uh, resilience and business continuity. And then finally, I will wrap it up um, by talking about contagion risk and how it uh, all comes together, um, contagion risk, business continuity and crisis management in the backdrop and from the perspective of integrated risk management. So integrated risk management, let me start with analytics um, and broad spectrum intelligence and how that should fit into our uh, internal data and data management and what is internal risk management to begin with. So I, I show here uh, a fairly um, a typical standard and very widely used and accepted definition of integrated risk management, which is a set of practices and processes supported by a risk aware um, culture and organization supported by technology as well that improves decision making. And of course, it is from a perspective of making a risk aware and risk sensitive decision making and how those decisions impact um, how we are able to how organizations are able to achieve um, their goals and objectives in a risk sensitive manner. Um, and I wanted to dig deep a little bit uh, into that and and talk about what else that entails. And here on the left-hand side, or excuse me, on the right-hand side, I have a few points and I will dig deeper into point number two. But let me start from the top. So holistic view of risk profile and exposures. That is what integrated risk management is really all about. It is about making connections, making connections as enabled by three key elements, making connections between people, between data, and between systems. Um, that really is a fairly natural uh, way to express what is inter, uh, uh, integrated risk management, uh, but I do like to think about that in, in those three pillars because it makes it a lot more tangible and it really um, provides a more actionable a way of expressing what is integrated risk and how that might come uh, to, let's say, to fruition, how it might be enacted in your um, uh, organizations. 
Integrated risk management should absolutely be ubiquitous throughout, throughout the organization. So it should not be just a practice of the risk management department or compliance department or of leadership. We often do talk about um, the front line, so the first line of defense owning risk. That is that is absolutely the way it should be. But there's also a, a you know, a, a bit of, uh, of almost a gap in what we hear talked about when we talk about integrated risk management. And of course, that would include uh, functions such as IT or operations. We have to make sure that the, the individuals delivering service to customers, delivering products or orchestrating projects and designing IT architectures also very well versed in risk management and in integrated risk management that they have a view on how their work and um, how they enable organizations is also done in a risk sensitive and risk thoughtful manner as well. Integrated risk management probably will never get off the ground unless it is supported by leadership. Um, so it has to be something that, that comes like a, a tone from the top as well. And it, it is a leadership that needs to make sure that this is a priority, that this is a framework that is accepted and established as well. And of course, it is enacted by the front lines. So it is the front line and the first line of defense that is the owner of risks from risk identification to managing access actions, uh, managing controls, etc. So of course, that's a bit of a primer um, on integrated risk. Um, nothing really new here, but I wanted to start with really addressing the basics. So back to the key elements and the three uh, pillars that I wanted to address today in the talk, which is data, systems, and people. Starting with data, um, it is really crucial in order to have a well-established and robust integrated risk management uh, program to have a really um, accessible data and data analytics program. What I mean by accessible is really something that almost everybody in your organization can see, can touch, can think about, can view and contribute towards. What does that mean? Um, dashboarding, for example, it is an, uh, it's really almost the epicenter of how this comes to life. I really encourage everyone to have a very robust and widely communicated, widely accessible set of dashboards because that is where your data, external and internal, starting with internal, actually uh, really comes together. And it is the data in itself, analytics and dashboards, unless they are dispersed, uh, among the, the wide organization, if they're just uh, for a very niche and very few small amount of uh, people they're accessible to, um, it does it have the power that it really can be. And um, this might sound quite trivial, but um, I think we're often surprised at how um, narrow the dissemination of various dashboards, analytics, and information is. So uh, the, the wider, the better, because you don't know how much um, or what. Uh, information others can put back to uh, to the data, to the dashboards with explanations, with action plans, et cetera. So it really has to be accessible. And final point on accessibility, it is not also just being able to view a dashboard, but set up those dashboards in a way that it is understandable for just about anyone in your organization, that it is not using concepts which are, uh, let's say, foreign or foreign to some or, or um, not easily understandable. That's also what I mean by accessibility. Update your information on a daily basis as much as you can. I understand that's not always going to be uh, possible, but often it is, and especially in a situation such as the COVID crisis, which has unfolded itself so incredibly quickly, having that um, daily basis um, information, uh, let's say the frequency update or real time, uh, which is ultimately uh, the best, is, is really important so that we are always uh, have at our fingertips the latest information about what is our current um, risk profile, what are exposures, how are they changing, um, so that it helps us anticipate and make risk sensitive decisions. And then finally, and also extremely important, um, connect your data with external intelligence. Um, there is a lot of information out there um, about, for, for example, the current crisis from spread rates to death rates to um, action plans to stimulus packages, macroeconomic data such as unemployment rates, 
filings uh, uh, and, 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 and more so. Um, that is really, you know, it goes to the heart of having a holistic approach to risk management is put, firstly putting your data together with as, as broad as, as a set of information and intelligence um, uh, as possible. Or where does that really come to fruition? Where can you benefit from that? Of course, stress testing, scenario analysis. If in mature organizations, you will see that perhaps stress testing is something that can be fairly frequently um, uh, executed. So now that we have a brand new experience with the COVID crisis, how is it impacting our cash flow? How is it impacting our employees? How is it impacting, impacting our, um, our market and say supply and demand? Um, we can put those new uh, ways that it has sort of evolved itself into our stress testing models and, and, and see what that tells us and, and, and for us to be informed about uh, by our models um, as well as well as us informing the models themselves with the same thing with scenario analysis we have now a scenario that has not played out in this magnitude ever before in the modern times um, so this is also a very interesting way to to connect all the data external and internal and and come up with scenarios that we have not um, perhaps been as prepared for as as we might have been for some others and of course all of that informs our decision making which is what this is all about um, for example in my uh, in my current organization what we've done in the very beginning of the crisis when we really realized that this is it's not going to be a, a v-shaped um, crisis and and, and recovery um, we very quickly put together operational risk uh, management dashboards, which we connected with few other uh, pieces of information. And those are available on daily basis um, throughout the organization as well, so that we, um, we can really respond to changes in in, for example, in our systems, uh, to changes in behavior um, and anything else. Of course, operational risk covers such a wide array of incidents that might happen. Um, as we know, in terms of in times of crisis, uh, perhaps in a remote setting, it might be likely that your fraud um, uh, incidents might go up or cybersecurity attacks that your systems are not as um, able to deal with this new situations that they have been before. So your operational risk dashboards can be very, very useful for a wide array of, um, of individuals. So that's number one that is on data. Uh, moving on to systems. Um, of course, systems with clean and again, accessible data here, accessible that word again. Um, uh, but in this context, I mean for it to be easily extracted and actually put into the dashboarding that we just talked about. Um, connections to analytical dashboarding and visualizations um, so that it really enables that real-time understanding within the organization of what is happening, what are the implications of actions and decisions, and based on that, then what, what are our plans for the future? Uh, what is very helpful here, of course, is the GRC tooling, uh, connecting risk, compliance, privacy, information security, uh, and perhaps even more, perhaps audit uh, findings as well to have a, a really holistic view on what is happening. Uh, having these kind of uh, um, supporting tools really helps. Um, of course, re incident reporting and monitoring, um, real-time alerts. So these are, you know, here I really do focus a bit more on the risk management tools and systems. Of course, those are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, most of the uh, companies uh, these days, of course, are enabled by a, a vast uh, structure of, of systems and technology as well. Um, and here, essentially, we have to make sure that not only are those all connected, but also that um, we have a proper understanding of risk management as it applies to the systems, vulnerability scanning, um, information security, again, to pr uh, protect us against breaches um, as well. And so what does that enable? It's agile and real-time decision-making, so enabling us to pivot, to make very quick decisions, especially in very quickly unfolding um, scenarios such as this. Again, holistic approach to understanding what is happening and what we might want to do in the future, and that that uh, helps us be, be prepared. 
Um, and then moving on to people. Um, in my view, of course, people are the essential um, element of a well-functioning uh, integrated risk management framework and, 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 and a function in general. It is, it is all about awareness. It is about training. It's about preparation. People need to really understand what are the roles and responsibilities, um, how they escalate um, certain events or incidents, and, and what do they do in, in regular times as well as in times of crisis. So here, communicate, 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 communicate. Um, communicate your approaches, communicate your plans, your decisions, etc. What do I mean by that? I'll, I'll go back to the backdrop of COVID-19 um, crisis scenario. Um, for example, what we what we did, we started communicating our approach first. So again, what does that mean? That means we let people know that we have a task force. We have it in our view. We are working on it. We are looking at our facilities. We are looking at our people. We're looking at our systems and we are taking a, a very deliberate and intentional review assessment and planning process so that individuals throughout the um, organizations understand that action is being taken um, and research is being done and preparations are being done as well. Of course, then once you start coming up with the plans, hopefully very quickly, you disseminate those plans as well, uh, providing lots of um, communication directives, um, um, uh, let's say uh, procedure guides um, and training. Uh, for example, we very quickly moved to Microsoft Teams as a uh, one of the ways to, to, for us to continue to be connected. Um, and there were definitely individuals in the organizations that have not uh, used Teams before. Um, so we had to make sure that everybody was um, trained and at least had some you know, basic or even a little bit more advanced user guides for them to be able to use that system to, to become connected and remain connected. Um, next, integrate teams into cross-functional task forces. This, this is also something that works very, very well. And again, it, it, come, it speaks to the heart of integrated risk management. Um, depending on your organization, your market, your industry, you might have um, needs that did not exist before, needs especially in servicing your clients and your customers. Um, for example, banking, financial services, and, and beyond. Uh, your either uh, your clients might be uh, asking for some sort of a relief um, for for payment holidays um, uh, and, and, and such. So you really have to make sure that you have the right people and, and a number of people bringing in various perspectives to really be able to decide who will get that relief, um, how this relief, relief will take, actually take place. So of course you have credit risk, um, you have compliance, perhaps your collections and AR uh, community as well and well beyond as well. So these cross-functional um, uh, task forces can be really crucial. And especially when they're put together very well, they can, um, they can start functioning very quickly. Um, and this could be a, a temporary or perhaps a longer term solution. Um, but I have seen um, these, these cross-functional um, teams work very, very well in these um, crisis scenarios. Uh, and I would highly recommend that as well. And then finally, escalation protocols. So here, what I mean is making sure that you look over your policies and your procedures and make sure that your governance is still aligned with your general governance framework wherever uh, adjustments need to be made, made those adjustments. Again, I go back to the example of the banking industry. If you're approving credit, perhaps you have to do that slightly differently, slightly quicker. Um, it is a different way of working, or perhaps you're not getting any credit requests uh, anymore at all because uh, the, the market has slowed down a lot. Um, perhaps your requests are coming in in a different form or for different things. Um, so that also has to be aligned with your general governance, with your general policies, but you could adapt what you're doing um, to respond to the per, uh, to the to this particular um, uh, situation and the particular crisis um, 
and I would always encourage everyone to put that on paper, uh, make sure that that is part of a terms of reference or policy standards, however you manage your governance, uh, but that it of course has proper oversight and proper training um, as applicable for those that are under the scope of your, of your policies. You might also find that you have new policies that are becoming relevant. So for example, uh, remote work policy. Um, not all um, organizations have that. Perhaps they have not been faced in a more remote or largely remote workforce, but now they are. So you have to think about um, certain things that, that you might want to consider um, now versus before, such as uh, what, what can be expensed. Um, it's just one example, but also flexible working arrangements. Of course, a lot of individuals are working from home and homeschooling their children. You know, how do you make sure, how do you enable your organization to uh, continue, continue working? Um, of course, this is from an angle uh, from, from, from risk and compliance. So um, just because you put together a brand new policy, make sure that that is really well understood and well published, publicized, communicated um, to your organization, uh, because it, it is, of course, enacted by, by the front line section, by the entire organization. Um, so it has to, it, it, the communication point here is, is really key. And it's not just for risk uh, policies or compliances or exposures, it's really for most of the decisions um, that impact the organizations should, should really be, be taken from, uh, from this perspective. Um, Well-trained and ethical. Again, um, a lot of the comp uh, companies uh, find themselves in a, um, in a new, unique way of working where we are all remote, we're all a little bit segregated. We keep in touch in a virtual manner. Um, so we have to make sure that the code of ethics, a code of conduct um, remains at the forefront and remains the driving force of how we behave and the decisions that we make as employees. Um, and to that also that our hotlines, our whistleblower and any other sort of forms of connectivity from that perspective remain well functioning and remain, um, uh, you know, observed and, and reacted to. So that's a little bit on people. So just to recap, integrated risk management, the key foundational pillars for me is data systems and people. And um, of course, integrated means that the connectivity there is um, in, across all of these dimensions. And that um, typically will, it might look slightly different across the different um, uh, industries and companies, uh, but the, the, the pillars and the principles remain the same. So moving on to business continuity and organizational resilience, um, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about um, continuity here, as well as how do we leverage um, integrated risk approach and in the crisis scenarios. Um, here, um, we can definitely recognize that having that integrated risk management um, let's say framework, especially if it's a mature one, really lends itself to uh, having a, a, a robust and let's say well-informed response to a crisis scenario. Uh, on the left-hand side, I have some data and tools as well as some compliance considerations. And those actually apply fairly well, both in normal and crisis scenarios or in business continuity disruptions as well. It's more about the, the how quickly do we respond and perhaps a little bit of the nature of the decisions that are being made, but the foundations and the framework uh, works quite well. Um, so in general, I could say that um, enterprise risk management, integrated risk management is, it does a fairly good job addressing um, risks, uh, including emerging risks in crisis scenarios and, um, and other sort of disruptions um, that, that we might be facing currently or in the future. So data and tools. Um, we have the GRC tools, of course, for um, internal incident reporting. Make sure that those continue to function and function well. Um, you might see an uptick in incidents, especially when your folks are moving to uh, remote work. 
and um, and you know they're accessing uh, systems differently. Their procedures might be somewhat different. That typically is correlated with an uptick of uh, operational risk incidents as individuals are adjusting to a new way of working. Um, dashboarding. I I won't go too deeply into this again. Um, uh, uh, I feel very strongly that that is a great way of of collecting, synthesizing, and disseminating information um, for wider use, as well as analytics, so more deeper analytics. Again, your stress testing and um, scenario analyses here um, can be, uh, you know, they fit very, very nicely when you are, um, where you're in a crisis scenario and you're leveraging your stress testing tools, you can feed different scenarios into it or different stressors, different elements, and be able to um, get a different additional insights um, from, from um, you know, what's going on kit, from disruptions in your supply chain, uh, from cash flow or liquidity stressors as well that we have been seeing in, in, this, um, in this crisis as well as previous ones as well. And then a little bit, of course, on compliance as well. Privacy should continue to adhere to your already established uh, policies. Um, I feel that, you know, we often are exposed a bit more in terms of crises, especially again, if we are accessing our systems um, remotely through VPNs, you know, through different channels. Um, then your cyber attacks, your privacy, privacy breaches, all of that comes together and can lead to additional, say, knock-on effects of us already dealing with a crisis. Um, data sharing, sensitive data uh, outside of the company still should be should continue to be strictly prohibited. Should continue to be strictly monitored and managed as well for for the reasons that that have already been outlined. And and again, conduct, workplace conduct, code of ethics remain um, extremely important, if almost not even more important um, because of the nature of how we are now placed a bit more separately, a bit more further away from the teams. Um, it is it is often the case that let's say your more remote worker, your more remote branches, or your more remote facilities, often um, will have a slightly higher risk profile, risk risk exposure, especially for for compliance or operational risks due to the the larger distance or the the further proximity or anti proximity that you might be. Um, experiences versus being at or near the headquarters. So that is integrated risk management, um, definitely a, a, a very robust um, framework that can continue to be leveraged in crisis scenarios. And then business continuity from greater management perspective. I wanted to provide a little bit of a, uh, maybe a slightly different angle um, on business continuity and crisis management. I know we often think about business continuity as, um, you know, we think about, have, have you done your fire drill? Um, have you done disaster recovery and, and things like that? For me, business continuity is actually ultimately an exercise in decision making. Uh, and in particular, in when business continuity moves into crisis management. It is how do we inform ourselves and how do we make decisions to go remote or come back to uh, uh, um, activate our redundancy uh, protocols or move to new facilities or, or many, many other protocols uh, regarding again liquidity, cash flow, um, and many other um, processes that, that take place in our organizations. Um, again, it is about decision making. So from that perspective, let me start a little bit here about the framework. So business continuity framework should really be informed by, inform by uh, integrated risk management and its principles and the information that it already collects. Um, integrated risk um, does a lot of assessments um, against st uh, stress testing, scenario analysis, and all of these are great elements to be fed into the general framework of business continuity and in crisis management. Um, and of course, and ultimately, they, they should be linked. Um, 
Then I will go on to the, 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 from the framework to the plans and the testing. So as we have a framework that is informed by IRM, then that will lead to what are our definitions? What are the definitions? What are the triggers? What are the roles and responsibilities for the, uh, let's say first line or the second line, uh, depending on, are we talking about liquidity or cash flow or operational risk systems, um, reputational risk, um, et, et cetera. So we have also business continuity continuity teams. Um, who is the decision maker there? Um, do we have task forces? Is that a council or a committee? Um, or is it just your, your, your um, ultimate leadership? Um, and of course, we have testing and training, um, uh, which also can be informed by, by your stress testing, by scenario analysis and things like that. Um, so that, that works very nicely and neatly together. Training and awareness, all, all the way to the right here. Um, so an organization that is trained and aware of all the elements of the plans that understand that we have particular triggers, for example, to, uh, to move to a remote, remote working scenario or um, activate um, revolving facilities or anything else that, that might be pertinent to your, um, to your organization. But um, for all those to, to whom that is, uh, that is relevant, um, it is really important that um, the organizations understand that there are um, business continuity plans and crisis management plans, um, that they are documented, that they are published, that they are accessible. Um, and I won't go into too much um, more deeply into business continuity, but um, I do think that it really does lend itself into going hand in hand with, with IRM. Um, then we have uh, people systems and beyond um, your integrated risk management in conjunction with business continuity often will go through a business impact assessment where you will um, um, select your key business processes and assess what might happen if that process was disrupted. So we'll take a look at who are the key individuals and who are the key roles and functions within that process? That, that process, what are the, um, the systems that it heavily relies upon? What would happen would be the implications of any disruptions to those systems? Does that process rely on third party data or third party services or any other vendor services as well? Um, this is also very much aligned with uh, the thinking behind integrated risk management as it puts a lot of information information systems and people together uh, here again. Um, and those in, uh, business uh, impact assessments uh, are very, very useful in business continuity as well. Um, so business continuity and, inter, uh, and um, crisis management really does involve many of the IRM principles. Um, in case of crisis management, these escalation protocols, decision-making and governance, those links, they become shorter, quicker, and more intense. And the more prepared we are, um, for that, um, the more resilient the organization uh, will become. So speaking of organizational um, resilience, I wanted to start here a little bit with what, what is that? That is, a, that is a concept that is relatively, let's say, I don't want to say new, but it is uh, has been uh, talked about with an, an extra intensity of the last couple of years, and especially um, these days. And it is an ability of the organization to anticipate, to prepare for, and respond to changes in our market and in our environment, and especially when there are sudden disruptions and with the overall goal that we prosper and we survive in the long term as a successful organization meeting our objectives. Um, here, I would like to refer to a, a really good, a very robust uh, uh, white paper and thinking that was put out by uh, Cranfield School of Management. I actually uh, personally had an opportunity to take some training um, in, in, in England uh, at Cranfield as well. So it's a really great institution. And they provide a really interesting and I think very useful and quite tangible way and model of how we can think about organizational um, resilience. They, they talk about it as essentially along two different dimensions. It is uh, whether we have a defensive approach or a progressive approach. A defensive approach is where we think about how can we stop bad things from happening. And a progressive approach is when we think about what are the new things that we should 
have happened what are what are the good things that we can we can engender and then we have consistency and flexibility so that is the other um the other dimension um consistency think about policies for example or your protocols and flexibility think about innovation and i will go into a little bit more um details on that as well but essentially around those two dimensions we have four ways of thinking about organization uh, organizational resilience we have preventive control mindful action performance performance optimization and adaptive innovation. So to start with preventive control. So this is a, so operational uh, resilience can be achieved by means of risk management, um, redu redundancy, for example, system uh, backups and other controls that we already have in our organizations, in our systems that prevent bad things from from happening. Those are very often um, governed by protocols, by policies, by uh, standard operating procedures. So these are your, your standard, um, let's say, walls, and, and let me put it that way, that prevent things, that prevent bad things from coming into the organizations. Um, these are we meant to protect us from, from threats. And once those threats are gone, we just essentially continue in the way that um, that we have progressed or functioned, operated um, before. And then, so that is the preventive control. That is um, your defensive consistency quadrant. Um, uh, and it is, uh, you know, your, your, the backbone of, a, of your organization and, and your control environment. Then we have mindful action. Mindful action is still defensive, but it, it, it thinks about um, a threat, especially when it has not been encountered before. And it asks a question, how can I, in a new way, or in a, let's say, by, by a pivoting, how can I um, answer this particular threat? So um, essentially, we are here reacting to unfamiliar circ circumstances, unfamiliar challenges. That is mindful action, still defensive, a de defensive enough approach. Um, but but um, you know allowing for flexibility uh, within within your framework. Um, so for example, if you have a new cyber attack, maybe from a source that you have not encountered before, or you have a new system configuration that. Um, essentially uh, exposes you to new vulnerabilities. Um, you know, for, and from that perspective, we might have to think about how do we continue to protect ourselves, but we might have to consider new and novel ways of doing that. Um, and then next we have performance um, optimization. Then here we are talking about um, your, your progressive. So how do we make good things happen, but also here in a consistent way? So how do we take our uh, current processes and make them better? This is um, actually, a, a, that should be happening in our organizations, regardless of a situation. It could be normal course of business, could be um, um, our, our crisis or uh, scenarios as well. But we need to continue to evolve and continue to review and adjust our processes, our systems, and then ultimately our services to our clients. Um, uh, and, and while thinking about how do we, how do we, how do we evolve, digitize, um, transform our, um, our, our current, um, current processes, current ways, ways of working and technologies. And then finally, we have adaptive innovation. Um, this is through creating and inventing and exploring the unknown realms of, um, uh, of our markets. Um, sometimes uh, uh, really responding to, to threats uh, that might also become opportunities as well in a, in a brand new way um, of, you know, of dealing with our process, even as a brand new technologies, exploring new market opportunities. Um, so, so to that, for example, I would not at all be surprised. In fact, I would really anticipate that many, many companies will take a look at their business models at this they currently stand and will say to themselves, while we may have survived um, in, in this current crisis, we cannot 
um, we, we cannot do this again. We will have to adjust our business models. We will have to adjust where we get our revenue from or our cost structures or funding structures and everything else so that next time we do not have to, for example, furlough individuals. We do not have to have layoffs. So how do we continue to serve our customers and provide our services in a way that is not as disruptive as, as what this um, uh, let's say COVID um, crisis um, has 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 shown uh, to be. So adaptive um, innovation. Um, I uh, I encourage you very much to take a look um, at at the the white paper in itself. I do have a link that is on this page as well as the previous page is the exact same link. Uh, but it is a really good uh, platform for starting to think about where your organizations, where your processes, and where your technologies fit in. And of course, your organization resilience. You know, resilience in, in general. We think about how do we bounce back. But organizationally, uh, organizational resilience is about how do we bounce forward? So how do we uh, leverage our um, functionality within those quadrants so that we can evolve ourselves and become more agile, maybe more digitized or um, however, you know, the transformation may take place in your organizations um, to continue being resilient uh, in this case, in this um, scenario, for example, with the COVID, as well as any other um, uh, crises that might be coming our way. And even though I do not have a glass, uh, glass ball, I am quite sure that something will happen again. Um, uh, that is the nature of the world. Um, so finally, uh, just a, a, uh, to wrap up on contagion risk. Uh, so risk of contagion, uh, you know, it's, it's been widely talked about in the banking world, especially from the context of the last um, financial crisis over 2008, 2009. Uh, but this is really applicable to so many other industries as well. Essentially, contagion risk is um, risk that a threat or an exposure might have really widespread effect throughout the entire systems, throughout your market, your industry, your supply chain environment, or really entirely in the, in the system as we have seen over the last two crises. Um, so we talk about financial um, contagion. There is a health contagion very clearly. We are witnessing, experiencing it um, today and right now. And, and what's next? Um, here, I would really encourage you to again, tap into the integrated risk management um, framework and, and think about your stress testing and scenario analysis and do bring in that external information um, uh, and build that into your scenario analysis and stress testing. For example, the World Economic Forum has a global risk survey that is a really interesting read um, and not often does it make all the way into the organizations and their considering of their uh, risk management fun functions and exposures. But um, if you look at the last, um, let's say two or three years, environmental risk has been really at the forefront, um, cyber risk, uh, uh, again, has been ex really highlighted as, as, as likely and something that is that might have a great impact on, um, on our organizations, on our communities, and our environments. And um, to that, I will also say that pandemic has also been talked about in these kind of surveys. So I would go as far as saying that this pandemic, it is not a black swan event, but in fact, we had ha have had H1N1, we have had SARS and MERS and few others. So um, these kind of external um, forums, external publications, white papers, they do provide a lot of information for us to consider and really think about from the perspective of IRM, business continuity, and crisis management. So finally, contagion risk and, and um, integrated risk management. A mature and well-functioning um, integrated risk management which is founded on a robust identification process can really, really help 
mitigate contagion risk. So again, starting with those foundations of having the right information, having the right um, well-trained and risk-aware people and supporting um, uh, systems as well. Um, when you, when, once you have a format and a framework that is very sensitive, can quickly alert you to change in your profile or exposure, then that risk contagion, of course, has of course has a much more much greater uh, uh, probability of being contained rather than if um, things are taking place that we are unaware of. I think that is that is pretty pretty basic principles. Um, well-structured and well-tested business continuity and recovery and perhaps resolution plans as well. Um, all of those are different ways, different forms and from different angles and perspectives uh, that ultimately come together along with IRM for us to think about how we respond to, uh, to crises, both from operational, uh, client servicing, funding and functioning, cash flow, um, liquidity kind of perspectives as well. Um, trained organizations, risk aware decisions um, can, of course, also help mitigate contagion risk. So if we are well informed, uh, when we have data information um, dashboards at our fingertips, we can really make those decisions much more quickly and, um, and take action, very specific and tangible action to prevent the spread of contagion. And then finally, agile systems, information and and data at everyone's fingertips. So um, making sure that all that information um, is widespread and well understood throughout your entire organization, rather than being um, concentrated in one or two um, of, of, uh, of your functions. Um, so a, a really interesting and a very wide, very deep topic as well. I could probably talk about it for another two hours, but I hope that um, uh, some of these uh, these principles and more of a high level uh, connecting of the of the concepts and principles and frameworks um, really helps you or give you something to think about as you go back to your desks and to your offices or home offices and you think about how we come out of the current crisis, um, how we think about our long-term um, evolution, revolution, adjustments of our systems, adjustments of the way we work, adjustments of our products and services that we provide. Um, and I hope you have enjoyed, and it was my pleasure to share uh, my experience with you. Thank you for sharing that, Natalia. That was really insightful. And uh, yeah, we understand that, you know, it is very important to make connections between data system and plan. That is also a core part of integrate, integrated risk management. And it also helps in turn in improving your crisis response. So, because essentially, as you said, you know, integrated risk management helps in emerging risk, so feeds into the decision-making required to ensure that you have your business continuity. And organizations need to address this with agility and that can be achieved when you have not only right system, but also right data and risk aware resources. So really thank you for putting that together. My pleasure.